Welcome to our studio guests today and to fellow travelers out in cyberspace, thanks to that nonstop stream of zeros and ones. My name is Peter Gobitz, co-founder of the Zero Project and moderator of the International Conference slash workshop on Zero. The Zero Project is a three-stage affair. There's a book project, there's an associated online event, and then there's the in-depth research program to follow. Today, session number 25, a rescheduled session, which had earlier been postponed due to unforeseen reasons, unforeseen circumstances. The speaker is Dr. Esther Tishman Frankel, formerly the University of Oregon, but meanwhile pursuing a different career path. Though a Shakespeare specialist, she opted to contribute a paper to the monograph on the earliest number zero to appear on a deck of tarot cards in the 15th century. There's a vivid illustration of the then newly imported zero entering popular European culture. And not only the number as such, but also the deeper philosophical significance. Our panelists today are Mrs. Deborah Axel and Dr. Miriam Axel, wife and daughter of the late Professor Amir Axel. He did so much to research and popularize the invention of zero. And the two ladies established a uh, foundation in honor of Professor Axel. It, the, the, the foundation promotes mathematics education in Cambodia. And they're also the co-organizers of this online event for which our thanks. So dear Esther, without further ado, Thank you. Would you please introduce yourself briefly and tell us about yeah. the article contribution to yeah. the monograph? So uh, the article is called The Zero Triumphant Allegory, Emptiness, and the Early History of the Tarot. And uh, I'm sitting in my uh, studio meditation space. Uh, I'm a Zen teacher. I uh, was also at the University of Oregon as a professor of early modern comparative religion and literature and as a administrator, dean, et cetera, for a number of years. These days, my day job is I'm a healthcare chaplain, an interfaith chaplain, as well as a Zen teacher, as well as a uh, tarot enthusiast uh, coming at the, the deck of 78 cards from my interest in early modern history and also from my interest in Jungian psychology. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to dive into uh, my, my paper uh, and... Uh, uh, take it from there. In the early modern period, <clears throat> what we now call tarot was known as the game of triumphi, i.e. triumphs. The game was not imbued with esoteric or uh, occult import. <clears throat> it was just a game, albeit a game embedded in the history of allegory. The tarot emerged in 15th century Italy as what appeared to be an amalgamation of two different series of cards. On the one hand, a four-suited deck of playing cards brought into Europe via the Mamluk Empire from the Muslim Near East. On the other hand, a deck of 22 allegorical images originating in medieval Christian iconography. In the amalgam of straightforward number cards, the Mamluk suits, and allegorically imagined triumph cards, the triumphi, we find a fascinating new game that collates the arithmetic logic of counting with the Western sublating or subsuming logic of allegory. And I'll say more about, about the latter in a, in a bit. It was here that zero entered the scene. One of the earliest tarot decks, the 1491 so-called Solabusca tarot, labeled the allegorical card known as the fool with a Hindu zero digit. This use of the Hindu numbering system emerged despite the fact that the other allegorical images in that very same deck employed Roman numerals. The Sola Busca deck thus very straightforwardly demonstrates the ways in which East meets West within the history of tarot and the history of Western culture. More precisely, the Sola Busca deck suggests the impact of the zero digit and the Indian conception of shunyata, of emptiness, that it conveys upon Western allegorical thought. So uh, first uh, slide, please. 
so what uh, this slide, this is just tarot is still a game that's played in various parts of Europe. Uh, this is a French tarot deck, uh, you know, and as you'll see, if you look at this, this tarot card, uh, this hand, you see that arithmetic logic that is so central to what we know as playing cards that comes into Europe from the, the Muslim uh, Near East. You know, twos are lower numbers than sevens. Threes will be to one. You know, this is just the logic of arithmetic. Next slide, please. Now, what I'm talking about in this amalgam, just to give you a visual, that Mamluk deck on the left, uh, that's from, you can find this in the Top Copy Museum in Istanbul. That's the existing, one of the only existing uh, uh, Mamluk decks that, that we have. The Mamluk deck, that one's from 1517, but it's a much earlier product, probably early 1200s. And you'll see, this is from the suit called Myriads. You'll see what I'm talking about here. These cards don't actually have Arabic num numerals on them, but, uh, but you can see the logic. This suit of myriads is the precursor of the modern suit of hearts or the tarot suit of cups. You see in the ways in which in a very straightforward arithmetic way, uh, on the left, you have, an, uh, you have the eight card, right? You have eight uh, separate cups, then the ace, then the two, uh, the card on the right is far right is actually the king suit because of Islamic uh, injunctions against graven images. There are no face cards in the Mamluk deck. But this is the deck of four suits that came into Europe uh, probably sometime in the 1300s. Now, that card on the right is from uh, one of the earliest surviving tarot decks, the Visconti Sforza deck that circa around 1480, maybe a little bit earlier. And, you know, the image, this is one of the allegorical cards in that deck. And again, you know, we know what that card is. That's death. You know, he's carrying not a scythe here, but what looks like a, a bow. Death kills us. <laughs> death triumphs over life. These are meanings that are just obviously embedded within our understanding of iconography, right? This is a part of the allegorical imagery that uh, built up in uh, the Judeo-Christian West. Okay, let's come back to uh, the, the main view. Playing cards were introduced, so we can just come back to all of us, thank you. Playing cards were introduced in Europe in the 1300s, entering the continent via Muslim Spain. Then as now, the regular playing card deck consisted of four suits with minimally illustrated number cards, what we call the pips, uh, ranging from ace to 10, along with a series of court cards for each suit. The gambling and trick-taking games that used these early card decks followed relatively straightforward arithmetic sim uh, principles, as I've been saying. You know, in general, higher numbers or more highly ranked figures like the king or the knight beat lower numbers, just straight arithmetic, high beats low. However, about 50 years after these first decks appeared in Europe, 15th century Italian artists and players introduced the suit of triomphi. Uh, a word that ultimately finds its corrupted, and perhaps I do actually mean the word corrupt, English equivalent in the word trump. Now, the word trump comes from triumphi. The modified five suit decks operated according to somewhat different rules. If you've ever played a game like bridge or hearts, you'll understand immediately what the triumphi cards enabled, namely a way to take a trick of cards without following suit. The, the triumph cards were invented in order to trump the arithmetic logic of the pips and court cards. You play a trump, does, arithmetic doesn't matter, right? Indeed, the 15th century tarot deck invented the whole idea of trumps in gameplay. Originally unnumbered and unlabeled, these special triumphy cards included rich and immediately legible iconography, like that death card I showed you a few moments ago. We know what death means. We don't need a number to know that death is powerful, right? That it's arrow, uh, bow and arrow or it's scythe cuts us down. So we see images of a vagabond, a mountebank, an emperor, the pope, a devil, etc. In gameplay, the value and meaning of these cards were determined not by numerical ranking, for they had no numbers or ranks, but instead by the divine comedy to which they alluded. Each image, each card indicated a successive moment in the unfolding pageant of man's salvation. The cards were called triumphs because they illustrated human life as a triumphant spiritual progress. Each card depicted a separate stage in this progress, a victory one on the path toward salvation, a new triumph on the road to heaven. 
Now, this notion of victory uh, harkened back to the tradition of ancient Roman victory parades, parades, triumphi, right? The Latin word for triumphs, where a conquering general returned from battle to parade his troops, his spoils, his captives down the streets of Rome. These Roman triumphs have inspired centuries of military, religious, and political spectacles. It's because of the Roman tradition, for instance, that we have an Arc de Triomphe in Paris, built to commemorate Napoleon's 1806 victory at Austerlitz. But Napoleon wasn't the first latter-day ruler to Im imitate the triumphal imagery of imperial Rome. That honor apparently goes back to Frederick, Frederick II of the Hohenstaufen dynasty, who in 1237, around about the same time that the Mamluk deck was first created, in 1237, Frederick II staged a triumph in Rome to commemorate uh, his victory over the city-state of Milan. In late medieval, and early modern Europe, the iconography of the Roman triumph became a common way for rulers to celebrate their power. At the same time, in 14th century Italy, just a century before the invention of the tarot deck, the iconography also made its way into literature in what would become one of the most popular and imitated poems of the Renaissance, I Triomphi, the Triumphs by Petrarch, around about 1374. Petrarch's poem, takes the imagery of the conquering hero and ties it to an allegory of redemption. The poem is a dream vision in which the poet, himself languishing in unrequited love for his beloved Laura, sees six interlocked visions of triumphal parades. The parades begin with the triumph of love, where the god of love displays his countless victories over warriors, gods, emperors, kings, biblical figures, etc., leading captives who include Antony and Cleopatra, Mars and Venus, and Samson and Delilah. From there, the poet moves to the triumph of chastity, where Laura herself is the conquering hero, hero over love, because a chaste heart proves stronger than the ardor of passion. From chastity, the poem advances to the triumph of death. Death is the great level, leveler who can overpower even the purest and mo most noble of souls, including Chase Laura. But in his turn, death is conquered by fame, the next triumph. The triumph of fame teaches us that our deeds can outlive us, just as Petrarch's writings about beautiful Laura have preserved her memory for eight centuries now. However, Fame cannot prevail forever. The next triumph belongs to time because even the most famous of heroes and deeds are ultimately buried by the dust of centuries. That takes us to the sixth and final triumph, the triumph of triumphs, the triumph of eternity. The poet writes, and I'm quoting a, a 19th century translation of the Italian. When I had seen that nothing under heaven is firm and stable, in dismay, I turned to my heart and asked, Wherein hast thou trust? In the Lord, the answer came, who keepeth ever his covenant with one who trusts in him. In what can we place our trust? Each step along the way, we are chastened by the impermanence of human existence. But each step also leads us one rung closer to the final victory, the triumph of the faithful who put their trust in God. Each conquering hero, love, chastity, death, fame, time, eternity, subsumes, sublates what has come before until finally the winner, Christ, takes all. As one literary historian put it, Petrarch reflects all the variety of life and still unifies his pageant by the inexorable movement toward eternity's triumph. Th thanks to the sublating, subsuming logic of allegory, Petrarch's poem manages to address the full range of human life, negating lesser joys on the pathway to salvation, but still preserving all within the triumph of Christ. Now, it's been 50 years since the art historian Gertrude Moakley argued that Petrarch's poem is the source of the imagery of the tarot's trump cards. Few now would uh, agree unequivocally with her claims. Petrarch's six triumphs do not neatly map on to that succession of 22 trump cards that I mentioned earlier. Most significantly, not a single one of the tarot trump cards celebrates chastity. Chastity is nowhere in the tarot at all. <laughs> and chastity is 
you know, arguably one of the most important figures in, in, ter in Petrarch's triumphs. Nonetheless, it is thanks to Petrarch that the idea of triumph gets tied to the story of spiritual awakening. What Petrarch gives us is this marrying together of triumphal imagery with the allegory of the soul's redemption. His poem is a conversion poem. Uh, in the final triumph, the seeker realizes that what he has been real, pursuing all along lies with the one truth in heaven in a way that decisively changes the history of playing cards. I can't state this strongly enough. In a way that decisively changes the history of playing cards, Petrarch marries the imagery of conquest with an allegory of the seeking heart. Thanks to Petrarch then, with the earliest tarot decks, we find the allegory of Christian redemption unfolding via a succession of 22 interlocking triumphs. Nearly all of the 15th century decks use the same set of 22 images. The Sola Busca, also a 15th century deck, 1491, as we will see in a moment, is a notable and very important exception. Furthermore, although there seem to be some regional variations in ordering among those 22 cards, nonetheless, consistent groupings of the cards always appear together, allowing us to discern the same three-stage path from folly to wisdom, a three-stage path that really defines the logic of redemption. Uh, as the tarot artist and scholar Robert M. Place described these three stages, the first group of cards is concerned with worldly power and sensuality. The second group depicts time, death, and the harsh realities of life, along with the virtues. And the third group depicts a mystical ascent through celestial bodies of increasing radiance. The succession of these carte de triomphe, these triumph cards, is predictable, ger generic, and would have been immediately recognizable to any early modern game player. And indeed, that generic predictability was essential for the game to be played the value of each card had to be immediately obvious and apparent in play. We, one had to know what a death card trumps, for instance. Uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. I just want to take a quick look at this. So here are three cards from the Visconti Sforza deck. Um, uh, Forza, or Strength, Il Gobo, the Hunchback, the, the Time figure, the Old Man figure, and Fortuna, the Wheel of Fortune. So with Strength, with Hercules you know, beating the Nemean Lion, and what we see there is, okay, here's, here's the vitality of life, but that is immediately trumped by the reality of time, by uh, age, debility, death, right? And yet that is trumped by the movement of fate. So this is the kind of threefold succession that the allegorical imagery in the tarot trumps enacts. Even without numbers on these cards, we know ah, this is the movement of a human soul as we encounter the reality of our finitude and the reality of uh, our ultimate uh, uh, trajectory toward God. Okay, back, back to the full screen here. At the same time, within the generic and triumphant predictability, there is one card among all the others that defies this prediction. I'm speaking here of the figure of folly itself, the putative starting point for the entire redemptive narrative. Each suit of 22 triumphs include a figure called il matto, often, uh, the crazy one or the fool. The fool card is extraordinary, literally. Within, within gameplay, it stands outside the ordinary scope of things. The fool's function in the game of triumphs is unique. Indeed, technically, the fool is not a trump card at all, but falls out of the sequence as the excuse, the get-out-of-jail-free card that releases players from either following suit or playing another card. The Fool's extraordinary status was celebrated in one of the earliest tarot decks, the aforementioned 1491 Sola Busca. In its overall design, the Sola Busca may have been conceived by, we don't know for sure, but by the humanist artist Ludovico Lazzarelli, a humanist and a poet who, like P Petrarch a century earlier, sought to reconcile Roman and Christian traditions. The Sola, Bu Sola Busca is noteworthy on a number of counts. It eschews the typical allegorical imagery in the Trumps, referencing instead figures from the history of Rome. So all of the Sola Busca Trump cards figure uh, uh, guys in armor that are clearly from the history of Rome and are label labeled as such with Roman names. It is also the oldest tarot deck surviving in its entirety. All 78 cards remain extant and can easily be viewed in modern reproductions. Indeed, Pamela Coleman Smith, the artist and occultist who drew the influential 1909 Rider Waite tarot deck, the tarot deck that has sort of spawned now more than a century 
of uh, tarot artists and tarot practitioners. She almost certainly viewed copies of the Solabusca cards in the British Museum where a complete set of photos was available. Coleman Smith's artwork spawned the modern esoteric tarot. The vast majority of tarot packs in, a, in use today are based on the deck that she produced in 1909 in collaboration with Arthur Edward Waite. We can see the Solobuska's influence most directly in Coleman Smith's Three of Swords, her Ten of Wands, and her Queen of Cups, and, and we'll show a slide in a few moments uh, of those cards. The Solobuska is also the oldest surviving printed deck. Its images were produced via, via the art of intaglio uh, copper engraving, and it is furthermore the oldest deck with fully illustrated pip cards. It's a very special deck, complete, printed, illustrated pip cards. It is not until the French and English occultist movements of the 18th and 19th centuries that we again find an effort to bring iconographic detail to the pip cards, to the ace through 10. For our purpose, however, what is most remarkable about the Sola Busca is its fool. The Sola Busca provides the first image of Il Mato, of the crazy or foolish one, to be numbered zero. Moreover, the entire Sola Busca deck is numbered and incorporates an oddity that one sometimes finds in modern decks as well. The trump cards all receive Roman numerals, right? While the fool and the four suits all are given Hindu Arabic numerals. Uh, next slide, please. So here we see three cards from the Sola Busca and you can see uh, on the left, that's the fool. It's hard to see right now, but to the left of his head, is are the letters, letters M A and to the right of his head T O. So all of the Solobuska trump cards are uh, are labeled with names, and then by the the base of his or the tip of the uh, uh, bagpipe that he's playing, you can see that zero right to the left between him and that tree uh, tree branch. Next to him, you see Panfilio, one of the um, Roman figures that is depicted in the Trumps, other than the fool. And you'll see uh, to the left of his body, toward the bottom, toward his thigh, you see a Roman numeral uh, number one. But then look at that far right image, that's the three of swords. And to the right, on the lower right corner, you'll see a Hindu Arabic number of three. So it's very strange and it's and now this is almost uh, the most common way to number decks is to give the, the trump cards uh, Roman numerals and the pip cards Arabic numerals, but that was not the case. Uh, next slide, please. I just wanna show the connections to Samla, Pamela Coleman Smith's. So there you see three very obvious influences of the Sola Busca on her deck. Um, these connections have been noted by many people that she clearly was influenced by the Sola Busca copies in the British Museum. But uh, to my knowledge, literally no one has talked about the numbering conventions of the Sola Busca deck. Okay, back to main screen, please. The just, juxtaposition of two numbering systems, Hindu, Arabic, and Roman, echoes the historical moment. In the late 15th century, Europe was just coming to terms with the use of the zero. Hindu Arabic numerals entered Europe through Muslim Spain and Italy in the 1200s, but only began to displace the cumber cumbersome system of Roman numerals in the 1400s, the same century during which the tarot was invented. Europe was suspicious of the new Hindu Arabic numerals, as, as many have noted. In fact, the 1299 Hindu Arabic numerals were outlawed in Florence, ostensibly because they enabled easy forgeries. If you're tabulating your goods and earnings, it's far easier to turn the uh, Hindu Arabic number 50 into 5,000, then to turn the Roman number 50, which is an L, into a sequence of five Ms, right? Made forgery a lot easier, which many people noted. The interjection of the zero as part of this numbering system nonetheless marked a huge and tumultuous advance for Europe, enabling such diverse phenomena as the vanishing point in perspectival painting, double entry bookkeeping, and the rise of modern science. And here, of course, I'm deeply indebted to Dr. Amir Axel, as well as to uh, the work of Brian Rotman and Charles Seife, and thinking about the history and import of the zero digit. The zero digit for early modern Europe was a terrifying oddity. Numbers help us count, add, subtract, multiply. They point to a world of things. Why have a digit, the word literally means finger, if you're not going to point to some 
thing. What is that digit that points to nothing, to no thing? Even more start startlingly, zero counts nothing and yet magically adds substance to all other figures. The numeral four becomes 40 or even 400, 4,000, 4 million ad infinitum. A little nothing bends us toward infinity. And thanks to zero, which itself counts nothing, the same nine numerals, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, can count everything that can be counted. As the placeholder that enables the decimal system underlying all of modern mathematics, finance, and science, zero enables the endless expansion of number. Even though zero brings nothing to the party, it can feed everyone there. <laughs> the concept of zero did not exist in the classical mathematics of the Greeks and the Romans, and it was an abomination at first to the Christian West. What use did a good Christian have for nothingness? God created something, not nothing. Indeed, as this work of the Zero Project strives to demonstrate in multiple and, and myriad ways, the concept of zero arose from the non-Christian world, from the Hindu notion of the void, of shunya, the word becomes, uh, becomes the Sanskrit term for the mathematical zero, an emptiness that simultaneously holds the potential for everything. The zero ties together emptiness and infinity, nothingness and everything. No wonder Europe was nervous about the zero. The Christian West likes to keep nothingness on the side of death, that great leveler with his mighty scythe cutting away all that is. Everything, in contrast, belongs with God on the side of eternity. Zero decisively upsets this neat dualist balance. Emptiness and infinity, nothingness and everything, instead become two sides of the same hollow coin. Back to the sola busca. In the very midst of Europe's encounter with the zero, we find a deck of cards that identifies the fool with this transgressive new concept. Moreover, Lazzarelli's deck underscores, underscores both the Romanness of the trumps and the foreignness of the fool. As we have seen, tarot trumps derive their logic and meaning from the tradition of ancient Roman triumphs, the parades that celebrated military victory and might. With Lazzarelli's deck, it's almost as if that triumphal logic is being disrupted by the interloping fool. In the first place, not only does the Hindu Arabic zero of the fool contrast with the Roman numerals on the remaining 21 cards, but the figures on Lazzarelli's trumps are all clothed in Roman battle gear, while the fool appears to be a Celt, bagpipe in hand and cloak fastened at the shoulder. Furthermore, the majority of the cards seem to reference periods of conflict within and ultimately the downfall of the Roman Empire. Uh, I'm sorry, the Roman Republic, well, also the Roman Empire. These trumps are not so triumphant. And this crazy fool with his bagpipe manages to turn an empty bladder of wind into music. A hundred years later on the island associated with the Celts, another poet would show us how emptiness can indeed amount to something. In his prologue to the 1599 uh, play, Henry V, Shakespeare's chorus asks whether the wooden O, that is the globe theater, the great globe, the world, the great big zero on the side of the south bank of the Thames, how that wooden O can co possibly contain the thousand troops, forces, and firepower necessary to represent one of the greatest battles of all time, the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, slides, please. So this, you know, zero is magic, <laughs> right? Uh, next slide. So the power of zero, right? There's the globe, a, a depiction of the historic globe. And here's that famous speech from Henry V, the prologue. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram with, within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million and let us ciphers to this great account on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Okay, come back. So, um, right. 
the power of the imagination, the power of nothingness itself, right? That that power of the cipher that allows us to connect us uh, uh, to bring the vasty fields of France into the hollow O, the emptiness, the zero of uh, Shakespeare's globe. As Ryan, Brian Rotman and others have described, Shakespeare's poetry is riddled with the riddle of zero. Exploring in texts as diverse as the sonnets and the great tragedy, what it means to, as Macbeth says, signify nothing. Rotman's reading of King Lear is particularly noteworthy in this context, pointing as it does to the figure of Lear's fool, who serves as the advocate in the case of nothing, Rotman says. The advocate for a world that resists and disrupts the subsuming winner-takes-all logic of triumph. Some 300 years after the Solo Bisco was printed, the father of the modern esoteric tarot talks about the fool this way. So this is uh, 18th century France. It's the uh, French author, uh, the Count de Gébelin, who is articulating the occult tarot as he was understanding it. He says, as for this trump, we call it zero. Although it is placed in the game, after 21 because it does not count when it is alone and has only that value which it gives to other just like our zero this trump is just like our zero thus showing that nothing exists without without its folly this 18th century occultist was referencing the fool's extraordinary role in gameplay right the fool as the excuse card is a complete non sequitur he can't win tricks he can't trump any card the fool card merely excuses the holder from play and at the end of the trick gets scooped back into their hand. No one can win a game of tarot with a fool card. But at the end of the game, when points are being tallied, the fool's value is as great as the highest trump card. Like the zero digit, the fool is both all and nothing. Now, the tarot as a card game was virtually unknown in the Paris of this occultist, Count de Gébelin, in, the, in his day in the 18th century, which is why he could say, oh, this deck of cards, which you've never seen before, has all of this occult meaning. It was relatively easy for him to posit esoteric origins and meanings for the cards and to give birth to the modern interest in the tarot as a fortune-telling divinatory device. Uh, and while nearly all of his assertions about the tarot were false, he ascribed it to ancient Egypt, he talked about secret societies, etc. His discussion of the fool was uncannily precise. According to this author, de Gévelin, the fool shows us that nothing exists without its folly. Indeed, the fool becomes an invitation to explore the emptiness, the folly, the blindness, the mystery, the lack of finality and substance the interconnected open-endedness at the center of each moment. Uh, nothing exists without its folly, says the Count de Gébelin. For myself, as an early modern scholar who also happens to be an ordained Zen Buddhist, I cannot help but return to the legacy of Shunyata, to the South Asian origins of the zero. And to think about it within the Prajnaparamita literature at the heart of Mahayana Buddhism particularly relevant perhaps to Zen in this practice of Zazen, a sitting meditation that seeks nothing more than open-ended awareness. One of the great 20th century Zen masters, Suzuki Roshi, had a name for this sort of folly at the heart of Zen, at the heart of meditation. He called it beginner's mind. Suzuki wrote, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. A life of beginner's mind, a life of many possibilities, such is the fundamental triumph the fundamental triumphant triumph of the fool. Uh, can we have the next and final slide? By the time the tarot was taken up by the likes of Pamela Coleman Smith, the folly of the zero provided an opportunity for a work of occult import. As Arthur Edward Waite wrote in 1911 in his description of the Trump numbered zero. So he is describing that figure on the left. That's from the 1909 Rider Waite Smith tarot deck. With light step, as if earth and its trammels had little power to restrain him, a young man in gorgeous vestments pauses at the brink of a precipice, of a brink of a precipice among the great heights of the world. He surveys the blue distance before him, its expansive sky rather than the prospect below. The edge which opens on the depth has no terror. It's as if angels were awaiting to uphold him if it came about that he leaped from this height. His countenance is full of intelligence and expectant dream. The sun, which shines behind him, 
knows whence he came, whither he is going, and how he will return by another path after many days. He is the spirit in search of experience. The zero provides the tarot with its point of origin, with, in Waite's memorable phrasing, the edge which opens on the depth. Thanks to the fool, the tarot deck becomes a mandala of Gnostic mystery. In the traditional allegories of the early modern era, a pilgrim like Petrarch places his faith in God and in God's revealed word. Waite's pilgrim, in contrast, embodies the sheer folly of Shunyata. The sun shines behind him. What lies ahead remains in shadow. He places his faith in all that has not been and cannot be revealed. The fool, round and open as a cipher, places his faith in the void. Thank you. My goodness. My goodness. My goodness. <laughs> That's, that was quite a presentation, uh, Esther. Thank you very much for that. Very eloquent. Thank you. Uh, does it justice to your career as a, a, a scholar? Yes. And at the same time, looking beyond to other uh, cultures and civilizations to try to contextualize what uh, we are generally blinkered for in the West. Yes. Uh, imagine growing up only knowing that and then not having any view of what, yes. what else is there, like the frog in the well. And you've managed to you know, transcend those uh, artificial boundaries. It's, it's very stimulating. I'm sure a lot to be said. The, uh, uh, but uh, the, well, let me let me contemplate my own questions. But let me first <laughs> put the burden on uh, Deborah and Miriam. You've you've heard the presentation. Yes. Perhaps perhaps you would uh, both briefly introduce yourself and uh, say a few words about your important work for the foundation, and then maybe ask any questions or make comments. Uh, about Esther's presentation. Uh, Miriam, I mean, uh, Deborah? Peter, There's Miriam. <laughs> Miriam, do you want to say something about the, the work of the foundation? Uh, I'll let you go ahead if you like. A few words, or do you want me to? <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go ahead. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, because of the mirror's um, abiding interest in uh, the origins of zero and his particular interest in um, discovering it uh, through his, his final book, he discovered, uh, rediscovered, I should say, the arguably the oldest representation of zero. What we are doing is continuing the work. We're particularly interested in furthering research um, uh, in Cambodia on why this zero was in was found in Cambodia and to learn more about that there isn't a lot of work in Cambodia being done on this and we're also because of the um, the well-known long and very sad history of of the destruction of much of Cambodia's educational uh, infrastructure uh, we're working to to do what we can to support that so that's that's the work of the foundation and and then I, I wanted to I guess um, your uh, Esther, your talk it, it takes me in a lot of different directions. There's a lot of uh, a lot of comments, and and uh, I, I think this was really really profound. And I, I thank you very much for this. I think that I was particularly taken by the the position of um, um, well the, the the idea that the the, the tarot cards have both the Roman tradition represented and the, the Hindu um, tradition of numbers represented. So they. So the cards really represent very much the the, the coming together of those um, of those those two civilizations. I think that's really fascinating. The 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 movement of the use of playing. Well, Amir was a his his um, his education was as a probabilist. So he was very interested in game theory. He was very interested in probability theory. He wrote a book about um, Fermat's last theorem, and and so that's really really quite at the core of who he was as a mathematician. And so I guess that interested me that, that we're moving from um, cards as purely a gambling um, device to something that becomes um, 
allegory, if I'm, I hope I'm not misrepresenting this, but it's an allegorical way of, of telling a, telling a story that, and, and it, and it becomes this, this, this Christian allegory. That's amazing. It's really fascinating. It's, I've been really interested. Thank you so much for that. No, you're completely, I, I didn't know or had forgotten uh, what Dr. Axel's, uh, his interest in, in probability theory, because it, 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 it's fascinating to me that these profound moments in human development have this play component to them. You know, it's, I mean, we see this in, in our own development as beings, you know, as, as children, we know that we, we, we just naturally try to work things out in play. You know, mommy and daddy getting a divorce that becomes, you know, the Barbie dolls arguing. Right. And I think that that happens right. at a cultural level, too, where we work things out in play so that I like to think about serious play. My own my own play with tarot feels very serious to me. This is serious play. And those are not dichotomies. What I what has been really interesting to me is what I um, my research right now is uh, into the history of, of dice, you know, of 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 you know, mm-hmm. right? Di- which I think are the mm-hmm. precursors to playing cards and also have this component going all like 3,500 years back where dice are both used in board games and then almost immediately acquire re- in, in ancient Egypt, require religious symbolism. So that link between allegory and play, it's really, I think it's baked into who we are as humans. We think things through as games and then games help us think things through at the level of, you know, divine, mystical, infinite uh, questions. Um, I keep seeing that link between human play and our uh, attempt to grapple with the most profound questions we have. So it's cool. We humans, yeah. Cool. And I, I also another another quick comment to that. Uh, I think it's fascinating the the place that mathematics holds um, practically, but also spiritually um, in in terms of how we tell stories. And I think the the, the famous um, uh, magic square that was found in the the, the entrance to the, the the temple in in Kajirao, that it's not entirely clear why it's there. Um, and magic squares have a very long history that goes back before the the the, the the, the origins of zero, but what? It, but it, it's not really clear all the purposes, and that that I think is also really really profound. Yes, yeah, and you know Kabbalah is in this too, and also contemporary with what's happening with the tarot, where you know, so there's like what's being brought in through Islam, and then what's being brought in through. Judaism and like the 1490s are such a weird time in Italy because you know it's it's both the expulsion of the Jews yeah. and and the, this so there's so much um, there's so much exploration here uh, to think about uh, and you know I'm not I'm not a an academic academic anymore so I'm not the person to do the research but I'm thrilled that the foundation is doing what you guys are doing because uh, somebody needs to keep exploring all of these all of these threads. Yeah. Miriam, Miriam, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Miriam, any questions yes, or comments? Yeah. Having heard this, yeah, a lot. I mean, this is this is really, really fascinating. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I guess I had two things that I, I wanted to pick up on. First, um, about you yourself, you you mentioned that you're you're an ordained Zen Buddhist, and I guess I'm just wondering. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you initially uh, got into looking at the the tarot cards and what your own um, perspective on on this is, and then I guess the other thing I, I'm really interested in this idea of, um, you know, the uh, of the fool is sort of being full of possibilities and this concept of the beginner's mind that you talked about in your paper. So I'm wondering if you could just briefly talk about that a little bit too. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I don't, you know, the tarot. I mean, I think this goes. This is Berkeley's fault. This goes back to my days as a grad student, kind of, you know going to places like the now non-existent Moe's and looking at books and finding old tarot decks and just, I think uh, the tarot appeals to, I, what I'm realizing is it appeals to the side of me that's interested in allegory, which you know fueled my academic research. But then um, there's also something about, about paper and books. Uh, my, the, my academic book, the book I wrote to get tenure is all about the history of the book. And I'm really interested in, you know, how the movement from scroll to, to books, to codex. Um, 
so I love paper and how and my husband is a bookman. <laughs> He's like a rare book dealer, you know, so books are a part of my life and paper. And there's something about the actual physical tarot decks and the, what it is to, to touch these very ephemeral pieces of human creativity uh, that appeals to me. So it's, it's, not, it's not an exact, <laughs> it's, who knows, you know, the mysteries of, of what captures our mind. Um, the idea of the, you know, the fool and, and open-ended possibility, I think that, you know, I, I grapple with this all the time now in my, in my, I call it my day job, my chaplaincy work. It's terrifying to face the unknown, you know? And so I see that with patients grappling with, with death or with tragedy and, and grief and, you know, all of those ways that we like day by day we encounter hopefully not in huge ways, but we all encounter those big gaps of, I just don't know. Um, and most of the time we try to avoid how scary that is because it's scary. <laughs> it's an existential threat. And yet we actually, for our sanity and for the planet and for human, you know, for everything that is ripping us apart as a, as a planet right now, we actually have to be able to be with what we don't understand. Um, and so, you know, whether we're talking about the zero or the fool or, you know, in Buddhism, the, the idea of emptiness as prajna is the ultimate um, heart of wisdom. We humans have to get better at, at hanging out with that or we will just rip each other and our planet apart. <laughs> there's, it seems like there's a lot at stake there. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I answered that either briefly or clearly. But Miriam, any, any other follow up? from that. This is your chance. <laughs> All right, then I'll then I'll jump back in. Unless uh, Deborah, do you have any follow up? Um, no, go ahead and ask your questions, Peter. Okay. Well, it's actually, I wasn't planning to raise this issue because it's becoming central to the zero project now, I think in my uh, explorations, because it is an exploration for me my real interest is in if zero is so important you know and nobody knows <laughs> suddenly you know where where it sprung up or how it would need to be investigated you know and nobody's doing it it just it just was mind-boggling to me when i was trying to find the answer and i thought i just have to find the right book or article mm. and nobody knows and not only does nobody know but nobody bothers Nobody says, you know, we can't have this. You know, we don't know this. We should study it. It's like, you know, any other thing that we delve into. We want to cure cancer. We study cancer, you know. So, but nobody did. So this is the, this is the, the crux of the Zero Project. And uh, my assumption, my work, our working hypothesis is that, okay, we've had all these numbers for tens of thousands of years, no zero, and then suddenly zero springs up. What could be the reason? Well, we don't know. There's very little evidence. So let's have a working hypothesis, namely that it was the general cultural context, uh, religious, philosophical, and linguistic, that set the stage for the invention. And conversely, its absence would have impeded the invention of zero. And that seems to be what has happened uh, because of the apparent rejection, dogmatic discounting of nothingness in the West. You know, since the days of uh, uh, Aristotle, you know, nothing cannot be something. And that was the end of it. You don't have to think about it. You can forget about it. It's, you know, it's too difficult to think about it. Or, it's, you know, we just uh, call it impossible. And that's the end of it. And in the, in the East, it seems to have been embraced and evolved and developed and, and eventually somehow led to the invention of the number zero. At least that's the working hypothesis. And we're open to verification or falsification. And that's what the Zero Project is. And we have 40 people now chiming in and the, uh, the opinions are divided. You know, we're just as confused now on this issue as we were in the beginning, but at least we're making some headway by having people talk about it and, and compare and contrast. Now, in that process, it occurred to me that if you look at, for example, the, which is a clear example in the case of China, it, it's, it started, their counting system started with, with this uh, phenomenon of divination. 
and this is a, you know this fits right into what you're talking about the unknown you know people have always been yeah. you know vulnerable to to the uh, to the the, uh, the the you know the acts of acts of nature you know uh, storms and, and lightning and, and night and and day and a threat of animals and all that kind of a thing so people have always tried to figure out a way how to secure themselves and one of the ways was divination and so they have in china they have these tortoise shells wow. and they would study the cracks on the tortoise shells and try to divine the future yeah. and it was you know it was carried to a high art and then you see it the numbers associated with it uh, not yet i believe decimal but uh, you know the precursors and then you see that segue into the rod numeral system, uh, which is much more sophisticated, much more accurate, uh, and much more scientific in the sense that it's decimal and it allows all the calculation that the Indian decimal system permits, but uh, in a different way, in a different format, which does not require the invention of a number zero. It, 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 it's a, it's, it's a, um, uh, a, a table with columns and they put the, the numbers you know, or, or signs into those columns and each column represents units or tens or hundreds or so it's the same decimal principle mm -hmm. but they don't need zero because zero just means there's nothing in that column and so that's that on the one hand gave them a tremendous head start on the other hand it, it shackled them because they never got beyond that point now what my, my point is my you know the issue is that it seemed to me suddenly, and this ties in with the modern conception that is being expressed by some people, that um, that mathematics is a form of divination. It's it's a way of very accurately, scientifically calculating. Mm. So we're talking about Amir here, also, uh, you know, uh, game theory and probability theory and all of that. Uh, that you can pin down the number of the options that may be in, in the offing and you can prepare for them. So it, it's a way of securing yeah. the future and, and the unknown. Well, it's also, you know, meaning making. Um, so there's a, a um, classicist, Peter Strzok, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, who's written a book recently about divination in the uh, classical, the Greco-Roman world. And he says, you know, look, we've been for years, we classicists have been saying, ah, yeah, that was their irrational side. We're not so much interested in that part of the Greeks and Romans. We want the stuff that like looks like modern science before the fact. And he says, no, 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 this is how they're thinking. And, and he connects it to modern cognitive science and talks about how intuition and what we, you know, what is happening when you're looking at the cracks of a tortoise shell, that kind of, uh, that sort of movement of our brains that grasp shape, you know, the origins of geometry, but also our uh, apperception of number, how this is, you know, this seems to be that way that the human mind works to uh, to hold meaning, to generate meaning. So it can be used defensively, but it can also be used expansively to uh, hold meanings that we push aside, to, to broaden. And I think, you know, when, when, uh, you know, whether it's like Jungian analysis or some forms of uh, divinatory practices that are more like in the world of self-help where people are using things like the tarot or the I Ching to uh, investigate their own feelings. Uh, the work that I do with tarot, for instance, is all about mindfulness. I think when we're educating our intuition, we're using that mathematical sense of uh, holding the whole in a way that can be really healing. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, all or nothing. <laughs> it doesn't have to be well, like, you know, bad number or we've got zero. It's like we've got the whole. If I if I can just, uh, this is what I was getting at. In, in modern physics, you know, we have quantum theory and, and everybody uh, will, uh, you know, very prominently say that nobody understands quantum theory and if you think you understand it you do not uh, and then there's this, uh, this gentleman this professor in France who basically punctured that whole balloon and the whole the the, the entire argumentation around it by everybody everybody's falling all over him themselves wrestling with this idea trying to make sense of it and he says look 
quantum theory is prescriptive. It's prescriptive. It tells you how to calculate. It's not descriptive. It doesn't say a thing about the outside world because most people in the world are still objective realists. They think that that they see the world as it is rather than as their you know their their cognitive <laughs> neural processes tell them that it is. <clears throat> Whether we don't even know if there is an outside world. Uh, so uh, he basically punctured that balloon, and to me, it's very enlightening to to have heard that and and make sense of it because I was also struggling with it in a different way. It's a, and, and so back to divination and, and mathematics as a scientific form of divination. It's a way of calculating and predicting the future so that you can be safe. You and your family could be safe uh, at some point. Um, and it, it clears up a lot of uh, confusion because people are trying to imbue uh, modern physics with a meaning of yeah. life and, and a meaning of the, of the world and interpretation of it. The whole idea of this drive towards unification in physics, uh, you know, everything seems well, to lead up to the theory of unification, but they're not able to unify because quantum physics won't merge with uh, uh, Einsteinian gra uh, gravitation theory. And, you know, they're fighting for this for 100 years, they're not able to unify. There's a, a quote by um, uh, uh, Bertrand Russell that says that, yes, the fact that that everything that uh, that we consider to be unified is a, is a product of ourself should not come as a surprise. That's what the self does. The self unifies experience into, uh, you know, some sort of comprehensible world out there that we can navigate. Uh, so yes, we're, we're, you know, on the on the face of it, people are always trying to unify their experience into something, but you should not project that onto the world. There may not even be a unified world or unified. Uh, so all, all of this yeah, um, uh, impinges on the zero project, and we don't want to carry it too far afield and lose the academics. But uh, keep it academic. Look for the origin of zero and try to relate that to the yeah, same beautiful. cultural context. All right. So uh, I've done <laughs> my daily. Thank you so much, Peter. Really preach. Uh, and there's much more to be said, but we won't get into that unless um, there is something else that the ladies would like to add. Then we can think about beginning to conclude and round this off and maybe have our discussion afterwards. Yes, shall we do that? All right. Um, That's wonderful. Heard, Thank you. Thank you. You've heard the questions and you've heard the, uh, the replies. And so with this, uh, we pre we conclude the previous postponed session, as well as the online conference uh, slash workshop on zero, and we will now launch into the publishing phase of the book project. So many thanks on behalf of the zero, of the team zero and the zero project for your kind support throughout, and until we meet again. Mm -hmm.